Hello and welcome, Ed Drew. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, David. Oh, thank you. So good to have you here, Ed. Ed, please tell us everything that we need to know about you in 60 seconds. Uh, I live in southwest London. I'm saved by grace. Uh, the Lord has kept me to himself. Uh, I'm married to Mary. I have three children aged eight, 13 and 15. Uh, I am the director of Faith in Kids, which is an organisation that's existed for about five years. And we are about churches and families working together to raise children. That normal good stuff that's been happening for generations, which is parents working with great local churches so that children get raised to know Jesus Christ. That's what we're about. Uh, it's the story of my life. Uh, I came to faith aged about 11 and uh, the Lord has kept me since then. Really good stuff. And you've just written a brand new book published with The Good Book Company, uh, Raising Confident Kids in a Confusing World. Tell us about this and also how you come to write it. Uh, it's a book that came about after a conversation I was having um, with a chap called Ed Shaw, who runs Living Out. And Living Out are working to help churches and individuals with an orthodox view of sexuality and gender to know what does it look like to be Christians? What does it look like for churches to welcome people who are same sex attracted, living a celibate lifestyle? And he mm. was saying that as he educates, trains, gets invited to churches, he said, what's incredible is most of his time is not spent talking about sexuality or gender. It's spent talking about identity. He spends his time explaining uh, that to be a Christian is primarily about identity. It's about who we are. It's about who God says we are, because what he finds is once churches and individuals understand that Christianity is not about primarily behaviors, it means they become more welcoming to people who are, I guess, not leading that orthodox, godly lifestyle yeah. so that they can welcome them in without fear that their church is being infected or or changed. I found that fascinating. And he finished the conversation by saying with a twinkle in his eye, of course, said, if only we could tell children this. Because he says, for most adults, it's news. If only there was a way of telling children that they are defined not by their behaviours, not by the grades they get or how fast they are in their school sports day, but by who God says they are, by who mm. Jesus, their saviour, announces yep. they are. That's where yeah. it started. And what a great message, Ed. So, so good. I know you spend a lot of your time around young people as the director of faith with kids, just like you were saying. We seem to live in such a strange time, don't we? We've had the lockdown, uh, the increase in technology use, and now a whole wave of these confusing messages around gender and sexual ethics bombarding our children on a daily basis. Have you noticed much of a difference in how children are coping with these things, Ed? I, I think there's probably sort of two opposite answers I could give. The first is our young people, our teenagers in particular, I think are finding these difficult days. So I am told that statistically uh, we're living through a teen mental health crisis. Uh, I know some families who are going through that. So I would say that through issues that many very clever people, far cleverer than me, are investigating, these do seem to be difficult days for young people mm -hmm. uh, for some of the factors you're mentioning. I think our young people are feeling under pressure from their peer group, uh, perhaps from their schools as well, and from a variety of other places. I would also say that children and young people are resilient. Uh, we need to remember that children and young people they find their security from mostly the messages they hear around them from those who love them the most. So a message of my book is parents, you're doing a great job if you're loving your kids and if you are teaching them of Jesus Christ. So that, mm. that is also the other thing to say, which is for parents, it can feel intimidating. It can feel like it's us against the world. It can feel like uh well our children are sort of being i don't know at, at peril now we live in a fallen world and it's difficult but i do want parents to hear 
God has you and God has your children. And to be standing on the rock that is Jesus Christ means our children are more resilient. They are more likely to flourish. They are safer. The gospel is for the harder days. Mm, yeah, so true. And as Christians, we know that we are made in the image of our creator. Why is it such a good place for a youngster to gain confidence, Ed? Look, uh, we're created beings. Uh, we we are not the creator. And social media, Instagram, it 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 lives off the idea that you are free to create who you are. And that sounds so appealing and it's doing wonders for social media, but it's not true. And more than not true, it's destabilizing. So it sounds like you're living the best life. You're living a dream. Create the person you want to be. Fill your Instagram with the pictures of the person you want the world to see you are. But that's incredibly shallow. And also, when a difficulty comes, you're left saying, is this me? Did I cause yeah. this? Is there any way out? What if I want to change? What if I don't like the person I was yesterday? So I, I want to say that to listen to your creator is freedom. To listen to your creator brings confidence. He knows better than you do who you are. So yeah. this is a message of freedom for our children. And I think as Christian parents, we can be on the back foot thinking that we've we have got some sort of indoctrinating nasty message we're telling our children it is the opposite the gospel gives our children freedom and security let them listen to their creator he works he is good yeah so good above everything else we want in our children's lives is for them to know the lord as parents what should we be doing to disciple our kids rather than outsourcing this to the, the sunday school in church ed again to be a parent i i think is frequently to be burdened to be worried to feel guilty to feel tired so the first thing i want to say is sunday school and your church exists in a beautiful partnership with you so it is okay to it's good to be going to a church where you're thinking what my kids are learning is amazing and I yeah. couldn't be teaching them this at home. And the quality of the leaders and the quality of the church leadership is wonderful. This is a healthy thing to say. It's a partnership. Now, partnership means both of you are doing the good stuff. So that is, as parents, the Bible does place the primary responsibility on us. We are the ones who are called to raise our children as that crowd of saints stands with us. So let's surround ourselves with a great church, but let's know we're doing it. Uh, I'm reminded of a friend of mine, Morena, who was on our Faith in Kids podcast. She's a single mum. She's got two teenage kids. She tells the story of going into church one Sunday and pushing her two kids through the door and saying to them, talk to anyone. And she goes on to explain she'd had a tough week with them. They'd had a tough week with her. She knew it had been difficult. She is saying it doesn't matter who you talk to in our church. You will be offered wisdom and love and care. So, you know, that is a good picture of the partnership. Morena had been trying all week to offer her kids Jesus Christ, to offer them wisdom and love. And she was now going to church at the end of herself saying, we need to, we need to be about church right now. Yeah. That's, that's a good story of partnership. Yeah. Yeah, so good. And I also heard you mention the podcast there as well, Ed. Tell us about that. Where can people get hold of that? Uh, if you search up the Faith in Kids podcast, I think it will pop up on most of the of the providers. We do two kinds of podcasts, one for parents, which we call the Faith in Parents podcast. You can still find it by searching Faith in Kids. That's just for parents. We're trying to do the everyday stuff. We get experts on Recent ones have been, how do we help our kids who want to play sports seriously? We've had an excellent author called Patricia Wirakun helping us with how do we talk about sex, bodies, puberty, that stuff. So in the everyday. And then we've also got a Faith in Kids for Kids stream, which is the whole family, usually in a car, 20 minutes, a bit of the Bible, a sketch, 
some things to laugh about and a few questions to talk about. Excellent. Where, wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast, and we're going to make sure that we get the links for those and we'll put them in the descriptions below to so make sure that you check them out. Sound really good. Uh, Ed, what are some top tips for the family Bible study together? I think the first thing to say is um, most most parents feel nervous about making a start opening the Bible with their children because mm. they think they're waiting for the day they know all the answers or they think they're waiting for the day their children start behaving beautifully and say, please <laughs> open the Bible and share yeah. deep wisdom with us. Please don't wait for either of those two things to happen. In my experience of parenting and my children, neither have happened. I have not become the world's greatest expert on the Bible. And my kids have not become perfectly well behaved. The picture my wife loves showing, and I love showing at seminars actually on this, is my family with a family Bible time happening where one child is 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 head over the sofa arm there. The other child is head over the sofa arm there. I've got two bottoms in my faces and I've got one child who looks like he's concentrating. And that's just because my arm is around him and he can't move. So my wife took that picture to say, this is what the author of family Bible time books looks like when he's leading a family Bible time, which is, is, it's a bit more chaotic than it could be, but my family is like that normally. Now they were listening yeah. and they were answering questions, but they were fidgety and they were wriggly. And uh, as they get older, they've got a bit less fidgety and wriggly, but it's still a struggle. So I want to say families get into the Bible. Don't expect your family to change. Don't expect them to suddenly become a different family. Don't expect you to suddenly know all the answers. But that's not how the Bible works. The spirit is at work. We open a bit of the Bible. We may even start a timer of just 10 minutes if we're starting out and say to the children, when this buzzer goes off, we're stopping. We're just going to pray to finish. In other words, it's not going to be tortuous. We're just going to have a chat about a few verses in the Bible. I make the habit of thanking my kids at the end. Because it's normally the highlight of my day. It's also normally very frustrating. In other words, I want this to be the highlight and it never quite goes as well as I want it to, but it's gone well enough. So thank the children, tell them they're doing well, thank them for praying, thank them for listening, thank them for talking. In other words, expect chaos and tell them how pleased you are that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. The Bible got open, the spirit worked, we've been fed with God's word. Yeah. So good. So good. I love that. I feel like I really need to see this picture, Ed. Is there any chance you can email it over and I can I can somehow pop it into the yeah, uh, I will. corner of the window as you're talking? Really good stuff. We know that our children are always watching, and this includes, doesn't it, when we suddenly face some sort of crisis at home. They're very good at watching how we deal with it. As Christians, what are some things that we want them to notice about us during a time like this, Ed? Again, um, your your children are seeing you in the normal and the everyday. Some some recent research uh, was just pointing out what we already knew, which is if our children are only learning about Jesus Christ in church, that's two hours a week. It's not enough. And it, it was this research made the brilliant comparison of raising our children to know Christ is like teaching them a foreign language. If they only learn that foreign language for an hour or two a week, they're, they're not going to become fluent in it. They need to hear their parents talking it. They need to hear visitors to the house talking it. They need to listen to it. They need to talk about it themselves. I just think that's a brilliant analogy that the Christian life is in the gaps and the crevices. It's in the confusion and the tears. So I think as parents, it just means don't, don't wait for the, I don't know, the laughter and the cheeriness to be talking about Jesus, to thanking him. Uh, just be wondering, you know, live the normal life, which is when life is difficult, how does the gospel speak to it? Uh, I, I think about times we've prayed with our kids for friends who are really ill. I remember praying with my kids for a friend of theirs whose mum had reached out to us to say, I'm not sure he's going to survive the night. And I remember not sleeping much that night and praying with my kids. And I just thought, I want them to know this. And they were young. One of my kids is only, I think, two. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to know this is what Christians do in times of fear and tears. So 
I personally am a big advocate of let your kids see that, you know, we're not going to share inappropriately those things we don't think they're ready for, but we are going to let them in as often as we can into the issues we're processing and how we're coping. Yeah, so good. Thank you. Really helpful stuff. You talk in a book about the dangers of us parenting religiously. What do you mean by that, Ed? Um, what I mean by that is Jesus Christ on earth was at his harshest with religious people. Uh, he was at his most angry with the Pharisees, the religious teachers. He shouted at them. He, he threw the tables over. He he used that memorable phrase. He said, on the outside, you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but full of death on the inside. Yeah. So that there's just that danger. And I think I think we know this and I think we're attuned to it. And people talk uh, about how do we avoid raising little Pharisees? That is, how do we avoid our children just being rule keepers? trooping into church trooping out of church without that sense of the lord wants our hearts he wants to know who we are and he wants our churches to be living places where we're honest with each other where we're bringing our difficulties and our struggles and he wants our homes to be honest where we're saying sorry to each other where we're fronting up about the things we're finding difficult where jesus christ is at work in hearts and minds rather yeah. than just external and i, I think yeah. it's I, the problem with me speaking about this on a video or a podcast is i make it sound easy these things i'm talking about are difficult it it is difficult being a parent i would argue is probably the hardest thing we do with our time i would also argue it's the most significant thing we do not many of us will have a ministry more significant than our children uh keep talking to them keep listening to them don't give up don't become cynical don't get hard-hearted your kids need you and you need your kids the lord is using both those ways both those directions the lord is using your children to work on your heart and yeah. the lord is certainly using you to work on theirs yeah yeah how important is it to remind one another that we are forgiven by the lord when we mess up and is it also important for mums and dads to show what being sorry looks like to their kids I remember hearing um, a senior ministry couple giving a seminar on parenting. They must, they, they, all three kids had grown up and they were saying, they said to prepare for this seminar on parenting, we thought back to how our parents did it. They said, we grew up in Christian homes, both of us. We had, so therefore we had four Christian parents and they said, we can't remember one parent ever saying sorry to us. And they said, that can't be right. Yeah. That can't be healthy. And I, I just thought it's, a, it's an incredibly striking thing to hear. I personally know how hard it is to apologize as a parent to my children. Uh, I think I, in my mind, I kind of find myself thinking, goodness, is it like two or three times this week? If I apologize again, maybe they'll just start to think, dad, who made you the parent? Why would we keep listening to you? You just keep getting it wrong. And that's the insecurity running around my head. I think as parents, we're constantly, not constantly, but we're often asking our children to say sorry to each other. They need to hear us say sorry to. And, yeah. and I make it sound like that's something we have to try to do. I, you know, I, I don't think we do. I, I don't think you have to try to make a mistake in front of your kids to say sorry. I think we're, if you're like me, you're making mistakes all the time. And they live with you. So they're going to see more of them than most. Yeah. It's good to say sorry. Nothing has yeah. gone wrong if you're saying sorry to your children. Yeah. You tell a funny story in a book about a lesson that you learned from a stuffed robot. Tell us about that, Ed. I actually, um, my wife corrected me recently. She read the book. Uh, what happened was we, um, we were going on holiday. And uh, in my house, it gets pretty brought just before we go on holiday and we were due to catch a ferry to france i'd worked out the timing and we were now getting very close to missing the ferry and we you know we i'd worked out the timing we had to leave by this time we all left in a rush and a hurry we were about 15 minutes away from home we'd only just started a journey and my children were all under about the age of eight i think so that 
that thing went up of who's got robot and robot was a you know a stuffed toy and uh i was driving and i remember thinking we're in real trouble we need robot so each of my children has had a different blanket or soft toy growing up that they they have needed in bed it's really common for children they get really manky and and threadbare but they're absolutely loved so we were looking around the car and we couldn't find robot and i went through in my mind and i thought are oh, we gonna have to go back and my wife and i didn't we didn't really have to talk about it because we both knew we don't think our son had ever slept without robot and i want to reassure parents listening if you're in that stage of life my son now really does sleep without robot okay you're not going to grow up with a 30 year old who still needs robot but without really having to talk about it, I turned back and I knew we were going to miss the ferry. But I also knew our holiday was going to be pretty ugly without robot. Uh, so we turned back, we got robot. And I tell that story because if I showed you robot, he is a deeply unimpressive soft toy. He is manky. He is smelly. He is threadbare. Bits of him is are falling off, but he's loved. Yeah. And my son wouldn't have been able to, you know, he wouldn't have put up with us giving him another soft toy. We could have bought him a brand new one, way bigger, way more expensive. He wanted robot. That's how precious our kids are to God. That's how yeah. precious they are to our creator. Our kids may be grubby. They may be a bit smelly. They may not do everything just right. They may not be perfect. They may not be as impressive as some kids in your church or their school. But they are known perfectly to their creator. They are loved perfectly. He, he is for them and he'll never leave them behind. He'll never be without them. He is with them all the time. And if they're trusting in him, they are safe forever. And as a parent, I need to be told that. I need to be told your kids are safe. Bad yeah. things are going to happen to them. They'll get injured. I'll weep over what happens to them. But they're safe because their creator is never going to leave them behind. He's never going to let them go. Yeah, so good. You've hinted at this already, but I think it's so important. Social media fuels people to compare their lives with other others, and kids are no different, are they? Uh, what, what wisdom can you share with us about kids and the use of technology today, Ed? Uh, so again, there's there's kind of two things to say at both ends of the spectrum. The first thing is, is as parents, let's not fear social media. Um, most most families' arguments are around screens. So I'm really clear that they're a cause of enormous upset and difficulty, and social media is, is a cause of huge problems. So I'm not saying we just leave our kids to it. We wouldn't do that with anything that's dangerous. But as with everything that is dangerous and fallen and broken and hurtful, the Lord has it and he is stronger. Christ has won over everything that is dark. So in him, we we can trust him. So the first thing to say is let's not make out that we as a generation of parents have a whole heap of problems that no one has ever faced anything like it before. The Lord has taken previous generations of parents through very difficult times and he has conquered but social media is difficult it, it it's main its main temptation is to tell our kids this is who you are and mm. your your worth is defined by how many ticks or likes or shares or whatever you get you are defined by what others say of you that's a lie mm. it's just not true they are defined by who god says they are everyone every human being the whole of creation is defined by our creator and mm. the reason we want people to know about him is because they're finding out the truth they're finding out they're created and they're finding out they have a savior so i, I think firstly we want to be teaching our children how do you navigate social media how do you navigate hurtful comments what do you do with them because hurtful comments are going to come at them in the playground they're going to come at them on social media they're going to come at them in texts they're going to come at them in their workplace they're going to come at them throughout their lives so this is an opportunity 
This is an opportunity to be teaching our children to listen to the better voice. Yeah. You, you, Jesus said, my, my sheep will know my voice. Let's teach our children to listen to Jesus's voice who says, you're my brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah. Part of that access to the online world then comes the potential contact with Paul and the, the encouragement of gender fluidity. How should parents be preparing their kids when it comes to these topics, Ed? Um, I, I think the first thing to say to parents is um, don't be fearful of one massive, big, terrifying conversation that, that you feel like it has to last three hours. Uh, that's not how any part of parenting works. There are some big, significant conversations a parent gets to have either in response to something that's happened or because some we're clear what is what is heading down the road. So um, the normal story of all of this stuff, bodies, sex, gender, sexuality, pornography, is it starts in the bathtub when they're babies and they notice their bodies and they play and they fiddle and they touch and maybe they're in a bath with their parent or in their bath with a sibling and they notice their bodies are different and that's how conversations happen and as a new parent it's a bit weird and it's a bit awkward and we end up having to talk about our bodies in ways we may not have talked about before that's where it starts it, it starts with little kids talking to their parents about bodies and where they come from and, and and what they're like and we give them the story of our bodies are beautiful they're not perfect but they're made well hand woven by their creator. So that conversation just carries on as they get older. The tone changes a bit. So if you can imagine with um, an eight or a nine year old, you might be then talking about when do you not touch your body or or when do you not just take off, you know, there's an age when you can take off all your yeah. clothes and run into the sea. And then there's an age when you don't do that. And so you just help your kids to navigate that. And equally this issue of pictures of naked bodies. There's an age where you just want to be teaching your kids. We don't look at pictures of other people's bodies that are naked. And if you see those pictures anywhere, you should turn off the screen or close the book or the magazine and walk away and talk to me about it. So I think we just talk about helpful pictures and unhelpful pictures and pictures we can look at and pictures we try not to look at. And then that word pornography gets introduced maybe when our kids are 10 or 11 or 12. The data says half of children have seen pornography by the age of 11. So I, I want to say to parents, wouldn't it be great if they have had a conversation with us first about helpful and unhelpful images? I had that conversation with my son recently. My son is 13. I just reminded him, I said, look, we, talk, I, we talked about pornography. And I just said, I think it's inevitable in the next few years, you're going to be shown pictures, images, films. And he, he did. He, 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 he told me he hasn't yet seen that. I believe him. And he said, what, you know, how can you be so sure that I'll be, you know? And I said, look, I can't be sure, but I think you probably will. I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. And we just talked about what he'll do. Uh, he doesn't need to be afraid. He doesn't need to be embarrassed. Uh, we just get into these conversations and you mentioned gender fluidity. You know, in some ways, that's a complicated phrase for something very simple. That's just God made boys and God made girls. And we talk about the difference between their bodies. The Bible is big on the difference in the bodies. Uh, and, and these conversations just happen naturally. We it's not possible for a boy to become a girl and it's not possible for a girl to become a boy. But boys don't have to play rough games and they don't have to be muscular, but they can be. And girls don't have to do ballet and they don't have to write poetry or sing songs or draw pictures, but they can. The Bible gives huge freedom uh, for girls to climb trees and play rough sports and for boys to write poetry and sing songs. You know, yeah. boys can be boys and there's freedom in it. Yeah, yeah. So good. So good. Ed, every mum and dad's dream is to see their kid make a profession of faith and therefore wanting to go on in their faith and make the next step. What advice do you have for helping mums and dads understand if this is a work of the spirit instead of them wanting to please mum and dad? Uh, you're absolutely right. That our children growing up 
to be Christians is 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 really what we want. And usually those things we want the most. They for the for the good, they shape our decision making. So that's great. So it means if we want our kids to be Christians, it means we're prioritizing church. We're prioritizing getting great Christian role models in their lives. We're doing our best to just be wondering what are the things in our lives that get cancelled? What are the things that get ignored? But what are the things that get respected and prioritized? So on the one hand, the things we want do make they do change our decision making. So I hope I hope Jesus Christ is changing our decision making. I, I hope he is affecting the decisions we make as parents and as Christians. But also let's know, as you are absolutely right, our children belong to the Lord and not to us. Our children's salvation belongs to the Lord and not to us. Christ is the author and perfecter of their faith, not us. And people use that phrase, don't they? God has no grandchildren. Uh, oh, yeah. He he calls children to himself as children or as adults. So therefore, as parents, uh, let's not let's not think we have all the answers. Let's not think we need to have all the answers. Let's not hold up to great acclaim those people in our church whose kids are Christians and let's not secretly wonder what those other parents got wrong whose kids aren't Christians. It's rarely that simple. Undoubtedly, there are things to learn from both sets of parents. Uh, but let's pray. Uh, I, I ran an evening when I was working for a church for parents to meet Sunday school leaders, you know, over a cup of tea in the evening. And I had one dad who was a head teacher who walked towards me with tears streaming down his eyes. And I was I was thinking, what on earth has happened this evening that's caused this? So I called him over and said, what's happened? And he said, do you know, I thought I was the only person in the world who prayed each day for my boys. And I've just discovered mm -hmm. there's another man who prays every day for my boys. And it was the, his boy's Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that seems right to me. Pray for your children and, and and get others praying for your children and um, and be ready for it to be difficult. But the Lord might give you a very easy journey. Yeah. I found this part of your book really, really helpful. You talk about preparing our kids for that second Sunday, the Sunday that once they've left home and have the freedom to choose whether or not they're going to go to church. Tell us about that, Ed. I, I made the point, if you actually look at the data, if you ask a bunch of sort of 17 year olds, will you be going to church in two, three years time? They normally 90 percent say yes. In other words, if they've grown up in church when, you, you know, that's a beautiful thought. You know, 18 years of great church. Everyone in the church knows their name. They know everyone's name. Maybe they complain. Maybe they get a bit bored, but they, they sit between their mates People talk to them. People love them. People invite them around to their homes. They think they're going to keep going to church. So probably the first Sunday after they leave home, probably they'll go to church again because maybe it's what they have always done. Maybe it's what mum and dad have always prioritised. So going to church is going to be very normal. But imagine that first church, that first Sunday in a new church. Perhaps no one knows them. Perhaps they know no one. It's not often in life we put ourselves in that place where we walk into a strange place with strange people and know no one. And the thought is going to go through their minds. Am I going to come back next week? Do I want to sit in a building where I know no one and no one knows me? And it might even be they leave that first Sunday service and no one has spoken to them. What would make them come back the second week? We just need to be clear that church going, a pattern of church going, the religion of church going is not enough. Yeah. What is make what is going to get your children to church on the second Sunday yeah. is faith. So faith good, in yeah. Jesus Christ means I'm going to put myself in a place that feels socially uncomfortable. I'm going to take myself to a place where I don't feel welcome, where I don't feel loved because God's people gather. And maybe they're going to try a different church. They're free to. But the point is, is there's going to be a 
a line of pain they're going to have to cross where and it's going to probably take months and it, it's faith that gets them there and it's yeah. faith that welcomes gets us to welcome the newcomer into our churches yeah Ed, this has been an unbelievable conversation. So, so much gold. And we haven't even touched the uh, scratch the surface in terms of what's in the book. Um, we're about to take a very quick break and then we'll stuff. come back. So, Ed, before we let you go, please take a moment to let us know your closing thoughts and also let people know how they can uh, follow you on social media. Yeah, you can find us at Faith in Kids, all one word. Uh, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Uh, we'd love to help you and support you. We have a, we have a website, faithinkids.org, and you can find all of our resources. Most of our church resources are free to download. Everything is free to download on the website. But you can also find links to books uh, that you're mentioning. And uh, if we can help, just drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Follow us, uh, let us help you, uh, and pray for us that we would serve families churches and jesus christ for his glory thank you ed thank you we're going to make sure that we've got a link to the book that we've been discussing as well as all of those social media platforms as well ed thanks again for your time really enjoyed speaking to you cheers david thank you for having me bye-bye